Hey, Robin, are you there? Yeah, hi, Bruce. Is this hey. Bruce, right? Yes. You don't you don't have a video? Uh, uh hang on. It should be bottom bottom left. Yep, I'm working on it. <laughs> The video doesn't have a red line through it diagonally. Robin, are you there? Are you there? Hello, I see you. Can you hear me? I can. Yes, and I can see you. All right, great. Okay, I'm getting the old man over here. Hold on. Hang on. No, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Yeah. You're logged in twice. I'm logged in twice. What does that mean? Okay. I'll, um, there you go. That's better. Okay. Okay. So we're good. All right. He's coming. Thank, thank you. Come on, Uncle Warren. Okay, sit there. All right. I don't think I got my side pulled up enough. You're fine. Get that over there any place. And if you can uh, get a, a bottle of water or something in the first room for me, I appreciate it. Okay. There you are. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Well, we faced a challenging time because I was in the hospital yesterday with... Uh, no, you were in the hospital Saturday. Well, I was in the hospital Saturday, according to Robin, and uh, came home. I like your tie, by the way. It looks like mine. Yeah. I thought and, I'd dress, uh, up. I thought I'd dress so up for you. I'm not as... Uh, well, as I should be, but at 95 plus, I'm still here. Well, you know, I'm not very mm. impressed with your age because my father turns 103 this year. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got some time to go. Yes, you do. I'm, just well, waiting, I'm waiting for um, Randy to come in. No, uh -huh. I don't know where he is. Help me when I can't understand. Okay, right. I will. Let's see what I have here. Nothing. You don't need any of this stuff. Not all this. None of this is notes. Okay. Okay, you trying to get on? I see another phone call talking to me. Randy. <coughs> okay, okay. then I'll person. hang up and let you in. See ya. Bye. Okay, Randy. Randy is right. Randy is logging in, so we'll we'll see him in a second. Yeah. So uh, is everything uh, all right? Why Why were you in hospital? I'm, I'm Robin. Uh, I'm not. I know Robin. Is this you a have your hearing aids? You got your hearing aids uh, in? The earbuds are are 
Right now, I have no idea where they are, and I miss them for okay. a couple of days. Now, he just asked me a question, Rob. All right, what's the question? Well, the question, the, the first one was, is he okay? What happened at sending him to hospital? Yeah, he's fine. Okay. Oh, asking about my health? Yeah, he's uh, fine. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm fine. I, I say I went to the hospital with some pains in the arm at the urging of a PA next door neighbor. Right. And they didn't find anything, so they sent me home. Good. And, Second and, question uh, was, do you have your hearing aids in? No, he doesn't. But I'm I'm here, so ask the questions and I'll tell them. All right. Well, the hearing aids are somewhere in the bedroom, but right now I can't <laughs> put my hand on them. And I don't generally use them because uh, I can, I guess, halfway read lips and and okay. uh, put together whatever questions I'm being asked and don't seem to have a problem on the phone. No, you won't. You won't. Well, here's Randy. He's he's on. So this is Randy Walker. All right. There's Randy Walker up there, right. and that's Bruce, and that's you. Okay. Uh, what's, what's, you don't need anything. The, uh, I'm trying to think of a McGregor reading. Halo. I don't know. Halo, Gregor. Halo, Gregor. Something like that. <laughs> Am I close? Lang me a long neck. Randy, 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 you're muted. Randy, you're muted. Randy, you're muted. What's the question? He's talking. Bottom left. Um, How yeah. about now, Bruce? There you go. There okay. you go. We need, Randy, we may need to turn our volumes up. However, we do that. But Robin is staying around to act as interpreter as well. All right. So you and um, Warren, the way that we're going to run this is we're going to pick up three, three and a half minutes into the presentation that I've already recorded. And then you and Randy now are going to start a conversation about whatever whatever Randy's got written down. So well, when we I, I, hang, uh, hang I, on, I, we I, need to, I need to have a blank spot first so that I can do an editing and lead in, and then Randy, you can step straight in. All right. Okay. So if we just go on, I can't see myself. Am I showing? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Okay. Go five, four. Three, two, one, you're on, Randy. Good afternoon, General Magruder. It's a pleasure Good to afternoon. see you again. On behalf of Sir Malcolm McGregor, Chief of Clan Gregor, Scott F. McGregor, current Chieftain of the American Clan Gregor Society, and all of the ACGS members present here today, I want to welcome you to the 114th Annual Gathering of the American Clan Gregor Society. The name Magruder holds an important place in the history of our society. In the early years, almost every member of the society was a Magruder. Sir Malcolm even has an aunt who was a Magruder. Today, you and I are going to pretend we are just two old soldiers having a cold beer at the American Legion telling a few war stories. These other people are just sitting around listening in. But sir, the big story today is your story. The story of an amazing life well lived. General, please tell us about you. Well, let's see. I was born in 1928 in Baltimore to Warren K. and Mary Dorsey Magruder, only child and very late in their lives. They were both in their 50s, early 50s. And my mother always said that I was created by an accident where she fell out of the car that did something to her system. Anyhow, I grew up in Baltimore and uh, went to the Gilman School, a preparatory school, uh, then to the University of Pennsylvania, where I got a BS in economics, then to McDaniel College because I was teaching at the Gilman School a Master in Education. But uh, I was lucky enough to... I uh, get a trip uh, in, in the military for 37 years. I was doing a survey on the International Chamber of Commerce, 
in Paris. And while there, I had several extra days, so I decided I would travel up to Scotland, where I had never been. And I was most fortunate to arrive there when a tattoo was being held in the stadium. And the most magnificent sight I've ever seen in my life was the pipes and drums and the bands that marched on to completely fill the stadium and then play in mass uh, very Scottish songs. And uh, it, it was a thrilling uh, adventure and entertainment and and just brought back many memories. And anybody that goes to Scotland, I urge them to look their, their calendar and see if that trip can coincide with a tattoo at the stadium. But uh, then uh, I was 37 years active in the military. I was in Korea three times. And the most challenging event, I guess, was watching an atomic bomb go off in uh, Yucca Flats, Nevada and uh, being able to, well, we had our backs to the explosion when it went off, and then we turned around and could watch the mushroom cloud. And we went into various distances from ground zero to see the damage to buildings and so forth and so forth. So I've had a variety of interesting experiences. I, I am not a combat officer. I've not been assigned to, to any combat unit that would put me in the combat, and I regret that, but perhaps uh, I wouldn't be talking to you had that taken place. So I'm here at 95 and uh, uh, have a lovely home on Bodkin Creek and wonderful neighbors, a boat that I take out, and uh, still able to drive the car to the grocery store, and a wonderful friend, lady friend that I've been doing things with for years up in Baltimore who Unfortunately, now is in the hospital with COVID, so we ask for blessings for her. And the Methodist Church, local Methodist Church, in fact, the pastor was just here this morning, has always been a big part of my life. And that's kind of most of the events in 95 years, I guess. And I welcome any questions or to expand on, or if I think of something important, I'll add it to you. Well, when did you decide to enlist in the U.S. Army, General? Uh, I'll be honest with you, I did not enlist. I got out of Pennsylvania in 1967, and there, about two weeks later, was a greetings notice telling me I had been drafted. So uh, I was uh, joined together with uh, a group from Baltimore, and uh, it was sent down to Camp Gordon, Georgia, into the building of the 504th MP Company Battalion. Hold and on. The, what year did you go into, were you drafted? You said 1967, but that, no, that's not No, correct. I did, 1951. 51 was when he was, when he was drafted. I didn't say 57. And uh, so then uh, when, when I got out, I, uh, Joined the reserve unit immediately, and I got off. I was drafted into an MP battalion, and uh, which was scheduled to go to Korea, but they, they changed our orders and kept them at Camp Gordon to provide services for the ROTC program, which was disappointing. Uh, but I, I did get to Korea three times, and. Uh, uh, had to not in combat, unfortunately, or fortunately, perhaps, and we got to see a lot of Korea. And then I was a senior logistician, and I was the player, senior player, where I played the deputy commanding general of armed forces Korea for three years in the army logistics exercise, log X, which was held every year. Uh, so basically, I'm a logistician. <laughs> Uh, I retired as a major general, and uh, I had a tour at the Pentagon as chief of operations and training at OCO Office Chief of Army Reserve. And my final assignment was a deputy chief of staff for logistics. So I'm basically an army logistician. Uh, keep the troops fighting. We give them everything they need. I wonder if I could ask a question. Above and behind you, there is a sword on the wall. What does that represent? You got a sword up there. Where is that from? Uh, 
uh, that sword, it's all family. I think, was an old family sword that was stored up on a farm. And uh, who I can't tell you the complete background, but I salvaged it and brought it down here. And uh, I've okay. never had any duels with it or anything, but uh, uh, it's sharp enough. I want to keep it out of the way. Fair enough. Well, General, uh, tell us how you became a member of the Sioux tribe and obtained the Indian name of Latanka. Uh, yes, uh, the uh, Atlantic Indians is an East Coast trap shooting organization. I was a trap shooter and I had some friends in it and uh, so uh, I applied an application and joined it, but I had been Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? I can now, but everyone. It's... I think we've lost the general. Yeah, we have. Damn. He's gone. Okay, here he comes. Are we back on? Yeah, we're back on. Don't know what oh. happened. Yeah, don't touch anything. I haven't touched anything. You touched something. I haven't touched anything. Okay. <laughs> can you see the eagle? On the, this is a headdress I made. And I did all the beadwork on here. Uh, made the, Took the eagle feathers, which I got from either a Montana sheep rancher or Forneyville's Indian Trading Post, we, the owner I got to know very well because I went out to visit him. These are ermine tails, and uh, they're beaded rings, I think, on side of this one. But I made probably eight or nine of them uh, because belonging to the Atlantic Indians, which had a ceremony that as many members as possible wanted to participate in, they wanted to wear costumes or at least a headdress, and uh, getting headdress made someplace was a challenge, and I could only do that as long as the eagle feathers could be bought, and that stopped a good many years ago. Too. Uh, but when I started making it, uh, ranchers could kill eagles and pony bills, had them in quantity <coughs> to sell. So I took and put uh, rosettes on the sides. How did you meet? How did you meet the gentleman who brought you into the tribe? How did you meet the guy who took you into the tribe? Oh, that was uh, uh, Frank White Buffalo, man. I, I met him uh, on a trip to uh, Montana and uh, Oklahoma. I, I met Frank White Buffalo, man, and uh, he uh, we got to be friends and. Uh, I'll read you this. is easier if I have time. Frank White Buffalo Man, uh, narrator of a, Bill's world champion, uh, writer and dancer, a member of the uh, Sioux tribe. Uh, I can't read all this. And his home address. I, grandson of Sitting Bull, member of the Hunkwapa Sioux, Give the Sioux name Latanka Ska, White Buffalo, to my friend Warren A. Magruder of Baltimore, Maryland. And that's written inside of a book called Crazy Horse, The Life of Crazy Horse. And uh, Frank and I corresponded, and he put me in touch with Indians that would make beadwork for myself and for members of the Atlantic Indians. But I say I put 40,000 beads on a pair of 
uh, leggings that I had made, and that was the biggest adventure. And I probably made eight or nine headdresses uh, when I could get the eagle feathers. So that, and the I'm still a member, uh, and the Atlantic Indians have this annual ceremony, and I was the uh, high chief and the medicine man and uh, uh, had different assignments uh, for the gatherings. You want me to take the headdress off? Yeah, we'll take this headdress off. But uh, I had to stop that when I could no longer buy eagle feathers. And uh, But I think the... Uh, and then I, I made a pair of leggings. Mrs. Red Horse made a shirt for me. And I made a pair of leggings, and I put 20,000 beads on the leggings with the squad lazy stitch. And that's interesting, and that's how the Indians would put beads on a garment. They would go up through the rawhide with the needle, string as many beads in whatever pattern they went, go across and run the thread back down again into the rawhide, come up again in the U for the second row, and you would establish the pattern of whether you wanted whatever you wanted to put on the buffalo uh, uh, an eagle or perhaps and and that way you could uh, uh, put it on the garment that you're sewing it for so i have a, a complete costume and uh, uh i don't know whether robin put this over here and whether you can see this or not but hold it up it, hold it up just a little higher there you go yeah. yeah, that's a headdress I made, and, and those are uh, grizzly bear claws, and the staff is, uh, well, I don't know what all you can see in the pipe I hold, I'm holding uh, below my waist, and uh, at the Indian organization, we celebrate by smoking the pipe, passing it on, take two puffs and pass it on, and uh, it's, a, it's a part of the ceremony. So uh, I've been very so happy to. I wonder, General, could you describe your time in Yucca Flat when you were basically, I guess, a lab rat for the atomic testing? They want to know about your um, being a witness of the atomic testing at Yucca Flats. Well, I was a, a, an MP battalion down at Camp Gordon, Georgia. And the tank bomb tests were going to be held, and uh, they wanted a representative uh, from the camp. And I was in the 504th MP Battalion and was selected to go out and observe this atomic bomb test at uh, Camp Desert Rock in Yucca Flats, Nevada. Interesting uh, story in the trip out. I suppose we were halfway out and lightning hit the plane we were on and put a small hole in the cockpit and the energies of the crew and the hostesses and all and trying to close that up was an entertaining show. But they successfully did it and we could continue the flight. It was just a small hole above the first seats on the on the. Uh, right hand side of the plane. I was about halfway back on the left when, when it hit and shook the plane. And and uh, But anyhow, then I got out to, uh, I guess it was Denver, and rented a car to go to Yucca Flats, Nevada, Camp Desert Rock. And they would I, I would stay there for an atomic bomb exercise. Uh, the atomic bomb was was dropped from a plane. We were some nine or 12 miles from ground zero. We had film badges and special goggles, and we were told to sit in the trench with our backs to the ground zero, and uh, uh, which we did. And when the explosion went off, I say at nine or 12 miles, it felt like someone slapped me on the back with a paddle. And 30 miles away in Denver, we broke uh, store front windows, and I have the Los Angeles Times, which mentions that. Uh, I don't know whether you can see a picture of this explosion or that. Won't be able to but that. atomic bomb dropped by B-29 Nevada test, and this was uh, October 27, 1951. 
and then uh, we went to various distances from Ground Zero, where they had buildings, uh, vehicles, uh, things that they wanted to evaluate the damage to. And while the Army denied it, there were horses there. I saw them. And the Army denied there were animals at the, in the exercise, but be that or may, it's over now. But it was uh, massive and, and, and total destruction, and gosh knows the most dangerous weapon, which I'm glad we never used. And well, in any to any extent in any war environment, and uh, I would assume that this was 1951, and that bigger and stronger bombs are now in our inventory. But that's just a guess. That's not, not a known fact. Uh, but it's not a weapon to fool with. <laughs> um, that is for sure. General, but I had, a, Dr. I had a, Dr. White earlier alluded to your interest in fishing. Could you tell us about your adventures fishing in the Chesapeake Bay and other bodies of water and the type of fish that you were seeking? Well, uh, my father had surf fish and well, his uncle and other friends were surf fishermen. And we, they went, family went to Ocean City, Maryland twice a year in June and uh, September. And as long, as soon as I was old enough to hold a fishing rod, uh, my father got one for me and I would stand there and fish in the surf. Uh, whether we caught fish or not, it was, Tremendous experience with my uncle and father and other friends. There were lots of surf fishermen back then, and uh, we you, we would catch a lot of kingfish and whiting. Of course, numerous skates and sharks. And uh, from there on, I just continued fishing. I had a friend that uh, lived on the Severn River. My closest friend had a place there, and he was a fisherman. So I would fish with him and his father. I had another neighbor who was a fisherman plus a commercial fisherman. So I joined the Commercial Watermen's Association and would put out gill nets in the Chesapeake and actually first in Bodkin Creek, but always continue the surf fishing. And that's probably the reason I bought this home on Bodkin Creek. So I could uh, have boats at my pier to go out fishing or fish from the shore. And uh, then I've been in Florida, I've been in Mexico, I've been in Costa Rica, I've been in the Bahamas fishing for sailfish and and have a, a record of most sailfish caught in a, one tournament and the largest dolphin caught in another tournament. And uh, Lady Luck was with me on most of my trips. And I would say I, I'm a pretty good surf fisherman and uh, had, had wonderful, wonderful experiences. And, Finally, uh, General, do you have any words of wisdom that you would like to impart to our members gathered here today? Well, uh, lang may ya lang rick. Uh, that's a start. But uh, enjoy life. Have, it, have fun and take care of your health and your family. That's number one. And it wouldn't hurt to be a member of a church or similar organization. Uh, that, that's enough right now. <laughs> well, General, thank you so much. And for be sure to be you're an active part. member of the Klan. And be sure you're an active member of the Klan Gregor Society and pay your dues. <laughs> General, thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of this gathering as our featured ACGS member and sharing with us some of the highlights of your fascinating life. And I, I second that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Okay. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure to have this interview, and I hope I've answered a few questions sufficiently and any time, and I just hope that in future years I may be able to send a gathering or two. I have all the, the cost necessary jackets and, and uh, Kilts and so forth to, to okay. look like I just walked out of Scotland. I'm going to I'm going to close this down, but I want you to stay online. I've got a few slides to show you that you'd be interested in seeing. So okay, I'm going to stop recording right. now.